You are listening to WQPH 89.3 FM, Shirley Fitchburg, Queen of Perpetual Help, and welcome to another edition of WQPH's Local Matters. On this week's broadcast, we flash back to 2007, an important Father Benedict Rochelle interview that took place shortly before WQPH decided to go on the air. And this is a significant interview because it resonates to topics today. And WQPH recently celebrated its ninth anniversary, so it's nice to flash back to see how it occurred. Visit WQPHradio.org to learn how you can support WQPH this Christmas season. Hello and welcome to Eternal Life Radio. This is Connie along with Mary Ann, and we have a very special guest with us today, Father Benedict Crochel. You undoubtedly have seen and heard Father on EWTN and at his speaking appearances. Welcome, Father. Well, thanks, Connie, and it's nice to talk to Boston. I'm an old Boston fan. I even was a novice in Boston, on Blue Hill. Wonderful, so I, I, Father. I'm, I'm a place, a person that loves Boston. I'm a New Yorker, but I don't particularly uh, enjoy New York. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Well, Father, we'd like to invite you to begin our prayer with the Angelus. Fine. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary Mother, Mother of God, God pray, pray for us sinners, sinners now, now and at the, the hour of our death. death. Amen. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according, according to thy, thy word. word. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God pray, pray for us sinners, sinners now, now and at the, the hour, hour of our, our death. death. Amen. Amen. And the Word was made flesh. And dwelt dwelt among among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Holy Mary, Mary, Mother Mother of God, pray pray for for us sinners, sinners, now now and at at the the hour hour of our our death. death. Amen. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. That that we we may be made made worthy of the promises of Christ. Christ. Let us pray. For forth we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, made by his passion and cross, be brought to the glory of his resurrection, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, we have some questions for you, Father Benedict, if you would be so kind as uh, to answer these. Uh, Connie, do you have a question? Where are we today after the many problems that have confronted our Archdiocese of Boston? Well, first of all, let me say that although I like to visit Boston, I haven't been a resident there since 1951. So I have to preface my remarks by saying that I am not terribly well informed about the particulars of the Boston scene. I've had the opportunity to discuss things with a number of priests from Boston who I very much respect and who come to our retreat house for priests on retreat. It's terribly unfortunate that the strong, vibrant Catholic life that characterized Boston in the past has been shattered by scandal by the real failure of Catholic higher education to provide a genuine Catholic education, by the failure of many Catholics, including clergy, to defend the basic positions of the Bishop of Rome, the highest teaching authority of our Church. And uh, there's a, a general malaise. Now, I heard recently from some priests that a very fine priest convocation was held and that it lifted the morale of all the priests that were there. 
that's wonderful news because you know priests are a terribly important part of the life of the church. They're not the whole church, as people used to think years ago. Uh, The church isn't ours, but we are important as servants and spokesmen for the Catholic faith. And particularly, since there's been the dramatic collapse of religious orders of sisters, and many teaching orders are on the edge of extinction, and Boston had beautiful, beautiful, vibrant communities. With this happening, parish priests and religious order priests are in a very special situation of responsibility. And uh, I don't, don't think anybody in Boston knows that better than your present Archbishop, Cardinal O'Malley, who's been a lifelong friend and confrere of mine. So I think there is a... a a general malaise, a feeling of defeat, uh, and you got to get over that. Uh, the Boston Irish were once known for their ability to fight. Well, they got to get some of it back. They got to fight in the right way. Oh, thank you, Father. I have another question here for you. Uh, we saw the defeat of the marriage amendment. Father Benedict, would you consider this a dead issue now? Anything but. It's just getting started. I understand various things about how that amendment was defeated and that there were clergy who openly spoke against the teaching of the Church, and I think this is scandalous and deplorable. And the issue is far from closed because it's an issue of the natural law. And you can't mess around, if you'll excuse the the verb, with the natural law and get away with it. On the one hand, you have people who struggle and suffer with same-sex attractions, and there apparently are more than there used to be, and they have a voice, and they have spoken up against prejudicial attitudes toward them and abuse that they had to put up with, and that was surely something wrong, and they were right to speak up. But to go to the extent of intruding on the definition of marriage, which comes from the the natural law, the divine law, the law of the gospel, and the law of the church, is a very, very dangerous thing to do. And it will not ever succeed. The United States embarked on a horrific, career of murder with a decision called Roe versus Wade. We've now killed about as many children as people were killed by Hitler in the Second World War. We're probably doing the country in. I heard Mother Teresa say many times that no nation can survive that kills its own children. It's a sin against the natural law. And unfortunately, So is the changing of the definition of marriage. People are obliged to, uh, all Catholics, all Christians, no matter what their orientation may be, are obliged to lead a chaste life, a life of sexual abstinence, unless they are married. And don't come crying to me, I've led a life of sexual abstinence all my life. I knew I was going to be a priest when I was seven. I knew what it meant to be a priest when I was 12, and I've been doing it ever since. So don't cry in my beer and tell me it's too hard for somebody to do that. Give it a try. We have an organization that Cardinal Cook founded called Courage. He asked me to start it, and I was too busy, so I got Father Harvey to start it. And we have a large number of Catholic laity, brave people spread throughout the United States who lead lives of sexual abstinence, in the face of same-sex attraction. And if people don't want to do that, that's their business. But for the civil government to change the definition of marriage is destructive and deplorable. And it won't go away any more than they thought abortion was going to go away. Oh, no, I was at a pro-life meeting on Saturday, and we had a demonstration in the streets of good old Manhattan. Wow, thank you, Father. That's very enlightening. 
Father, what do you think is the importance and role of Catholic radio today? Oh, I'm delighted by Catholic radio, and that's why I'm on this today, squeezing it in between teaching all morning and teaching all afternoon. Right now I'm going to walk from this program into a three-hour class in pastoral psychology at St. Joseph's Seminary. And what a preparation, you know. I ate my lunch standing up. That's how important I think Catholic radio is. And around the country, there's been a, a big burst of small Catholic radio stations controlled by the laity, supported by private donations of the laity, and bringing the gospel not only to Catholics, but to many other people. I, I think you may know that there are 2,000 Protestant evangelical radio stations. They're way ahead of us on this, but we finally woke, wake up, waken up, and I think uh, uh, it's one of the very positive signs of what laity can do in the church. It's a marvelous example of lay apostolic work. And it should be supported generously because the people who work in it either work for nothing or if they get paid, they get paid like church mice. Thank you, Father. I hope you're going to pray for us here at Eternal Life Radio because we would like to bring more Catholic radio to uh, Massachusetts. That's our goal. I understand you have the opportunity to buy a radio station right now. Yes, we have the dream, Father. Well, uh, we need the I capital. have a little bit more than the dream. Mm -hmm. I have one very substantial, large donation. God bless the person who gave it. I don't know who they are. Uh, I can say it's a donation of a million dollars, but you need couple more big donations or a lot of little ones to come up with the price of the station. And yes. I can implore the people who are listening to me to reach down in your pocketbook and make a sub sacrifice, a substantial sacrifice, whatever that is for you. Long after you're gone, the Catholic radio station will be doing a great deal to give blood transfusions to the state of Massachusetts and to the city of Boston. Thank you, Father. Father, how can we defend our children against the forces of evil? Well, we've been fighting with the forces of evil since we began. Yesterday I baptized a whole raft of kids who are abandoned kids and uh, institutional kids, and while saying the baptism, and these kids are in their early teens, I said the exorcism and the prayer against evil, which is in the baptismal ritual, and they were all very interested. They all wanted to know what it meant, and they were very glad to get the exorcism. Now, evil is around. Christ tells us that the devil is the father of lies, and it, we must remember that Christ himself suffered his bitter passion and death because of the prince of darkness. The Bible says that right there, that Satan entered into the heart of Judas Iscariot. And so we are dealing, as St. Paul says, not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers. Those are the names of dark or fallen angels. Now, where do they do their worst? Without any question, I would say, the absolute corruption and immorality of the popular media in the United States, especially of television, Internet is leading millions of kids and millions of adults astray. And we need to speak out about it all the time. And sometimes it's absolutely bold, brazen iniquity, like the uh, network called, uh, I don't, don't watch television at all, but it is a network that just is aimed at teenagers. MTV? On TV, yes. Hmm. And that people will know which one that is. And they tell me that it's constantly seductive and if not profane. And there's a popular uh, television show called Comedy Central, which spends its time blaspheming God and making fun of the Catholic Church. What you can do is sit down with a pad and write down the name of the sponsors. 
Don't write to the program. Don't write to the station. They're your enemy. Write to whoever who is paying the bills for this, Cosmopolitan Gelatin or whatever it happens to be, Transcendental Electric. Get through your Internet their email address and write them a substantial letter telling them that you are mobilizing your friends, relatives, and enemies not to buy their product so long as they're advertising through this kind of garbage. And be very, very clear and very rhetorical. And see if you can get a whole lot of other people to write to them, too. I am told the names of some of the sponsors on this television station and this program, and they are respected American corporations. How do they get away with this? They get away with it because Catholics don't say anything. That's, that's how they get away with it. And, uh, and throw that in with the media, that the, t- the newspapers that delight in humiliating, attacking, and taking completely out of context bad things that happen in the Catholic community and in the church, and you've got a, uh, a, a prescription for a lot of trouble. But I'll be honest with you. These people are so bad that I'd rather have them against me than for me. They're going to learn when they walk into the ultimate conclusions of their behavior. You know, in Germany in the 20s and early 30s, they made a tremendous amount of mockery of the Catholic Church, of Christianity, and of morality. Where did they end up? They ended up paying the price. And we may end up there, too. A study of Germany before the rise of the Nazis is a very, very interesting thing. The age of Mac the Knife and Berthold Brecht. They were cynical, sarcastic, immoral, and look where they ended up. Wow. A lot of food for thought there, Connie, huh? Yes, indeed. We have another question, Father. What is happening in our Catholic colleges today? Well, for the most part, I consider it a disaster. The word that comes to my lips is apostasy. Apostasy is when you are a believer and cease to be a believer. Years ago, there were about 200 Catholic colleges where parents could send their kids and know that they would get good moral training, good example, a good environment, and solid teaching of the Catholic faith and doctrine. I'm the uh, author of the new introduction to the Cardinal Newman Society's directory of authentic Catholic colleges. Out of the 225 in this country, there were scarcely more than 30 that merited addition in this directory. Now, there are a couple, a lot, a number, I would say, that are pussyfooting all the way around. They're half-baked Catholic colleges. I told them in my preface, clean up your act and look around and do some housekeeping, and maybe you'll make the cut the next time. It's sad to say that there is not a single Jesuit college on the whole list. Now, I come from a Jesuit family. My father and all my uncles are Jesuit students. And one of my uncles worked all of his adult life as an employee of the Society of Jesus. As I was growing up, I was deeply influenced by such great Jesuits as Father Daniel A. Lord, S.J. Only the other day, I was a witness in the cause of beatification of a great Jesuit, Father John Hardin, who was proposed the beatification by the Archbishop of St. Louis, Archbishop Burke. But look at the mess. I understand that Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts, is having some kind of due in a week or two at which Planned Parenthood is formally represented. What in the world does this mean? And that's not the first time that Holy Cross stepped out of line. My uncle was the youngest graduate of Holy Cross when he graduated, Dr. August Groeschel, and probably was always the youngest graduate. He graduated when he was 19 from the cross. And he would turn over in his grave, my uncle, as he knew what was happening at the cross. So 
may I suggest that you check out exactly what's happening. It's in the Catholic papers. I read it myself. God is not mocked. I am myself writing to the Father General of the Jesuits about this outrage, as I have written to the Father General uh, about what goes on in some classes at Boston College. But I recently preached in the Mission Church in Roxbury for the Franciscan Little Brothers of St. Francis. I gave them an account of my unhappy correspondence with Boston College. Six or seven young people came up to me after my sermon, and they said, we're students at Boston College. And I said, well, I hope I did not offend you. And they said, no, Father, you were too nice. You were too nice. So if the shoe fits, wear it. And I would love to debate this with any Jesuit or representative of the New England province of the Society of Jesus, because I respect the Jesuit tradition, which is the tradition of St. Ignatius Loyola, St. Francis Xavier, and St. Isaac Job. Well, Father, we would love to sponsor that debate should that be forthcoming. And uh, hopefully our college students who are the future of the Catholic Church will all be formed in the real, true spirit and teachings of Jesus Christ. Um, Another question, Father Benedict, what can someone do to protest any practices that aren't in concert with our Roman Catholic faith? We, We have a lot of people calling us and saying this, and we don't want to be negative. We want to build up the body of Christ. Well... The first thing to do is start at the beginning. Never protest someone's goings or comings uh, without having someone discuss it with them. I know people who have attempted to discuss things with Holy Cross, and they've told me the uh, ambiguous, uh, off-putting answers that they got. They'll make an answer, of course. They'll give you an explanation, but it is an explanation. So if it's something with a parish or a priest or a religious, talk to them first. And then if you don't get any place, tell them, oh, I've got to go above you. And then you go up to the diocesan authorities. And you go up in step. The dean, the auxiliary bishop, who probably is a vicar general, and you keep right on going, writing respectful letters, And if you don't get any place, send a letter to the Vatican Secretary of State. Send one to the Apostolic Nuncio first, uh, and uh, and then to the Secretary of State. And your letter will get passed down back. But it says in the Vatican Council, the people are the church. I wish that were true. If the people were the church, the church would be doing a lot better right now than it's doing. But what's happened is the church is being pushed around, probably with the best of intentions, by the keepers of the gate, the people in charge of the the collections. And the actual fact is that the Catholic faith is suffering, the Christian faith is suffering, and people are being spiritually damaged. And again, I'm happy to debate that one with anybody at any time, at any reasonable place. Thank you, Father. I think Connie has one last question for you. Father, what is our best defense in building up our church and families? Prayer and adoration of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. There is the answer. If you go through church history since the time of St. Francis, who was the one who made popularized devotion to Christ's presence in the Eucharist. Every time there has been a time of difficulty or turmoil, the Catholic faithful, the authentic Catholic religious and clergy have turned to Eucharistic devotion. And this is where I would start, and it's what Pope Benedict asked us for and Pope John Paul. Turn to Christ, listen to Christ, and he will tell you what to do. I want you to know that I didn't say one thing on this program today that I did not ask our divine Savior to send me his Holy Spirit so that I would not say too much or be unkind. And if you think I said too much, 
know that I didn't say much of what my own ego tells me to say. I'm trying to simply reflect the truth that the Holy Spirit wishes the church to hear. I think we've got to quit right now. Yes, I'm Father. I'm excited to talk to you all and my friends in Boston. Let us pray for each other. Let us stand by the church. Let us be open to our dear Christian friends, Protestant and Orthodox, our dear Jewish and Muslim friends who also worship the true God. And let's work together with everyone who wants to make it a better world. God bless you all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Benedict. That was so beautiful. Thank you. God bless you, and I hope you'll come back on the air when you have the time and uh, the Holy Spirit calls. Thank you for listening to WQPH's Local Matters. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast and hope you have a blessed week.